Hey, beautiful people. This is Alexis Fernandez, the host of the podcast, Do You Fucking Mind? A podcast that teaches mindset hacks backed by neuroscience. This podcast gives you the tools you need to set boundaries, not take shit from anyone, to increase self-love, confidence, and even move on from an ex. I'm also going to teach you how to rewrite hardwired negative self-beliefs. And if you like going deeper into science, I even delve into what effects drugs and neurotransmitters have on your brain. So if you're okay with getting a little bit of tough love and the occasional swear word peppered in there, then this podcast is for you. Join me at the Do You Fucking Mind podcast, mindset hacks for a badass life. Hey everyone, today's guest and co-host is the kind, thoughtful, and very talented John Bradley, who played one of my favorite characters in Game of Thrones. John and I talk about his new movie Moonfall with Halle Berry, self-worth, conspiracy theories, early loves, how Game of Thrones changed his life, how it almost killed him a few times, how he used the wrong accent throughout the entire show, deal breakers, and a lot more. Today's first caller is Allison, who is getting cold feet thinking about her upcoming wedding, but it's not about her groom. Well, it is and it isn't. Allison's maid of honor doesn't like her husband to be and has been blatantly disrespectful. To complicate matters, she's also Allison's boss. Next, we talk with Ashley, who has always felt like an outsider when spending time with her father and sister. After her mother passed away, Ashley hopes to become closer to the rest of her family, but doesn't know how to start. As always, thank you for listening to our podcast. If you have a question and would like to talk with us, we would love to hear from you. Just look for the link at unqualified.com. Ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to Unqualified with your host, Anna Ferris. John, it's so lovely to meet you. It's lovely to meet you too. Thanks for giving me the chance to speak to you. I saw an interview you gave on Conan O'Brien where you talked about your experience on Game of Thrones and it was really moving. So I was hoping you could just repeat all of it. (laughs) Do you remember what I'm talking about? Yeah, absolutely. We shot that special with Conan right at the very end of my Game of Thrones experience. And I was just looking back, as you tend to do when you come to the end of something that's been such a big part of your life, looking back and thinking what a transformative experience it was for me in all the different ways that it changed my life. And I remember just thinking about the person that I was before I got the opportunity to be part of that show. Before I met David and Dan and before I even heard about Game of Thrones, I was somebody with such low self-esteem and, you know, struggled with my weight and struggled with my self-worth and didn't really think that I would ever amount to much from a sort of quite tough working class background, no expectations of life and thought that life had no expectations of me as well. And all the time when I was thinking that and thinking that I'd never be worth anything to anybody and wishing I could change so much about myself, there were two genius writer producers in Hollywood, believe it or not, who were looking for exactly me. At the time that I thought nobody would ever give me a chance and nobody would ever believe in me, they were looking for me. Not only would they accept what I perceived to be my shortcomings, but it was my shortcomings that they were looking for. Everything that I wanted to change about myself were the things that were going to change my life for me. And and they really saved me from all that. And I'm not sentimental by nature. And I try not to look back very often. But I think I was allowed in that moment, pause for thought to realize just how much they and just how much that show changed my life, changed the way I saw the world and changed the way that I saw myself. It makes me emotional to hear you say that they were looking for you because they were. And if you could tell your younger self something, essentially distilled to like a hang in there message, it speaks to that in such a beautiful way. Yeah. And also just, you know, in terms of just really not knowing what's around the corner in terms of the unlikelihood of what happened over the course of the next decade, it wasn't even a dream. It didn't even feel possible to even dream about it, let alone achieve it, you know? How were you proactive in it then? Were you doing theatre? Were you auditioning? How did that happen? Well, the first round of auditions, I was still at drama college. I trained for three years at a drama school in Manchester, and I was coming to the end of my third year. I just signed with my first agent, 
And it's one of those strange things, isn't it, where there's such a slice of luck involved in terms of so much about your life in general, but so much about your career as an actor is so out of your hands. I know. They decided to greenlight that show in the year when I was just about to graduate from college. If they'd done it the year before... I wouldn't have been able to do it because I still had a year to go. So you're at the mercy of so much. But I think you just have to be ready and sharpen your skills to the extent that when these opportunities do present themselves, you're available for them and you're open to them. But, you know, it's the type of thing where you just think if it hadn't worked out, what would have happened to me and what would have happened to my life? But it's kind of tempting to think like that, but it doesn't do you any good either. When you were studying, did you have that sort of stereotypical like bitter actor mentor? A hundred percent, because that's something that you only really think about when you leave. I think when you're in any kind of drama training, there's almost a sort of cult-like thing about it where you don't know anything and all you've got to go on is what they tell you. And who are you to question it? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You have to completely wholesale believe in what they tell you. But part of it makes you think, hang on a minute, you're telling me what to do and what not to do, but you're not doing it. Completely. And if you were that good, you'd be doing it. You know what I mean? Yeah, I certainly had that. You know, it was like the mentality of if you can do anything else, you should do it. Yeah. That feels hopeless to me. What if I try and I try and I try and I try and I never get anywhere and I'm just pushing the rock up the mountain and getting buried in discouragement, which as an actor, you have to sort of negotiate how you deal with rejection and... You must trust yourself, right? Yeah. And so any sway from that can be pretty rattling. I think so. When I was at drama school, we had a final one-on-one -on -one tutorial with the head of our school. And they said to me, you'll never play a vulnerable character in your life. They said, vulnerability isn't something that's on your palate. And maybe they were right at the time, I don't know. But they said, you have a kind of wall up to the world. How Fascinating. I know. All the acting choices that you make have this spin of irony to them. And it's like you're commenting on the role and not actually giving yourself over emotionally to the part. And even at the time, I didn't think that was right. And then I was in Game of Thrones playing a very, very vulnerable, broken character within the space of a couple of months. So you talk about rejection and the pressures of the industry and the way critiques or comments of you or your work can affect you. And I think that they affect you differently if you think the person who's saying them has a point. Right. And sometimes you just think, oh, no, they're wrong about that. You know what I mean? They're just flat out wrong. And I think that you react to both of those different sides of the coin in different ways. If somebody says something about you and you think, yeah, I wasn't great there. I didn't quite get to where I wanted to be with that. That hurts you. But if they're just wrong about it, it kind of brushes off you. Yes. I think it takes a minute to get to that place when you can assess that well. John, I had some great advice once told to me. Someone told me that I should, on every job, pick an actor to learn from. And I wanted to ask you if you could do that with both Game of Thrones and Moonfall. Yeah, of course. On Game of Thrones, there were so many actors that I could learn from and so many actors that I did learn from. But I think the person who I learned the most from was Jim Broadbent. I was lucky enough to have a season working with Jim Broadbent, who, you know, Oscar winner who's done so much great work and he's into his 70s and he's coming into the sort of home straights of his career. Somehow they managed to persuade him to come on to our show and do a season supporting my character's narrative. And what I learned from him was, funnily enough, I'm going to say I learned the same lesson from him as I learned from Halle Berry when I was shooting Moonfall because, you know, they're both Oscar winners and they both achieve so much, but they still both have a real desire to get things right. They're not coasting necessarily and they're not resting on their laurels. They will come with arguments and they'll come with ideas and they will challenge directors because they have a sense of the performance that they want to give and the character that they want to play. And I think that it's such a lesson that you should never stop learning and you should never stop striving to make good work no matter what you've achieved in your career so far. I found the pair of them really inspiring. And you know, when you have a lead like that, who is collaborative and wants to ask questions of the writers and wants to ask questions of the director, that emboldens you to do the same. 
it took me a while to gain enough confidence where I thought I could have an input. I just thought, oh, I'm passive. I'll just say the words as they are, do whatever I'm directed completely unthinkingly and unblinkingly and just take the notes as they're given. But it took me a while and it took me working with people like that before I realized, hang on a minute, I've got a contribution to this. I've been thinking about this character and if I've got a suggestion, I've got the right to voice it. But it took me a while to sort of break through that. I don't know if you've kind of felt similar things in the early stages. Oh, very much so. I still feel it. Yeah. I feel like my story in Hollywood, kind of going through the regiment of Scary Movie, having done like four of them, there's so much precision work in there. So I couldn't stray. And that was essentially my training ground for film. So it was like the prop is way more important than I am for this joke, you know, or whatever. But I felt lucky, as I still do. I remember when I was working with Emma Stone on The House Bunny, that was kind of the first time I saw almost like a new style of acting. Yeah. Where it felt incredibly organic. That takes like a tremendous amount of confidence to do. And that was really the liberating concept. And then, of course, you know, seven years on a sitcom. <laughs> that's a whole other journey because it is so precise. Yeah, that's a question that I like to ask actors about preparation and how much preparation they do and how much preparation you think is important because I've always prepared. I've prepared forensically for every single scene that I do. And you're right, when you meet actors that seem to just be able to turn up completely kind of unprepared and just start turning over, they just produce this stuff. And sometimes it's good and sometimes it's not. But when it's great, it's really great. And when it's not, it's kind of forgotten about. Uh -huh. I still don't think that I'm confident enough to have the faith in myself that I will come up with something great if I just don't prepare. Because I always think, oh, if you don't know what you're going to do, it feels like a fluke, like it feels like luck, you know what I mean? And maybe I've had too much bad luck in my life to sort of rely on good luck, but I always have to feel that I'm working and bring something and bring something that I think is going to work. I just don't trust the cosmos enough to give me something great. It's true. There's so many things that are out of our control. We must have something. And I enjoy the process of preparation. How old were you when you first felt like you were in love? It's a great question, and it's a very deftly worded question. I was quite a romantic child. I remember having big crushes on adult women when I was like five years oh, old. Uh -huh. And that sort of felt like love at the time. I remember feeling love or, you know, feeling some essence of sort of romantic love as a real physical pain when I was a little tiny kid. There was like neighbors and like people in the neighborhood who I just used to go and talk to because I kind of had a crush on them and I was sort of in love with them. I remember feeling some sort of semblance of some sort of romantic stirrings even back then. But then when I did fall in love, eventually, I realized that that wasn't love at all. Like 16, 17, 18? Probably, yeah. I mean, all my love was very, very much unrequited for a very long time. We've talked a bit about rejection already, but romantic rejection was something that I thought would be just so mortifying, just so unrecoverable from. You know, there were people that I really liked at school and I'm thinking, God, they don't know that I like them. But if I went to ask them out, for example, and they said no, I just have to change school. Yeah, yes. There's no way that I could ever show my face around here again if I declared that I liked them and then they said no. Compared to the benefits of it going well, the risk of it not going well just outweighed everything. So I just never told people that I like them, ever. I didn't have a girlfriend until I was 25. Are you still with this person? No. Have you experienced extreme heartbreak? To be honest, no, I don't think I have. But this may sound slightly callous and maybe a slightly warped thing to say, but heartbreak is probably the worst thing that can happen to you. Breaking a heart can be just as bad. Oh, yeah. I think that that's something that I've had to sort of deal with the guilt of that. Because I think if a relationship ends and you're the one who's had your heart broken... It's horrible, but there's a sort of comfort in that, that you've got right on your side. There's a righteous anger. And you can go to your friends and say, he did this to me and he's broken my heart. And it's the powerless position. So you have the comfort of that. Exactly. But if you're the one to break a heart, you've got those feelings. You're bereft and, you know, you're mourning for a relationship that didn't quite work out. But you've got guilt as well. 
And I think that that's not an enviable position to be in. And I'm not saying that that's a worse position to be in than having your heart broken, but it brings with it a whole different set of emotions and regret, which can be just as difficult to live with, I think. So, John, may I make the assumption that you were the one who ended that relationship? I was. And I think it's a theme that sort of happened in relationships since, really, that I think the best thing to do is to bury my true feelings and bury my true kind of frustration because I don't want to hurt the other person. I want to live day to day happily and any sort of umbrella worries or concerns that I have to not really think about them in the same way that you don't look at the sky sometimes, but it's hanging over you all the time. But sometimes you think, I'm just not going to look at that today because I think that's the kind of thing to do rather than having a big conversation. And I've learned recently that's actually the cruelest thing you can do to let somebody believe that everything's okay and to not voice your concerns because, you know, that can't be sustainable. Things like that do end eventually. And when they do end, if you've been doing that, you've just wasted so much time and other people feel they've wasted a lot of energy and commitment to a relationship that you were feeling in a slightly different way about. So I've just learned that honesty is the most important thing. And they may be awkward conversations to have, but once you've had them and everything's on the table, you won't regret it, I don't think. I think you're right. And I do know that inclination, especially in my 20s, as my career was building, it was like boyfriend, check. Even though we had a pretty atrocious relationship, it felt like something that was just sort of settled. Yeah. My brain was filled with too many other things to really examine it. Yeah. I think that, you know, it's a bit of a cliche, really, but cliches are sort of there for a reason that looking back on my formative years, not having a girlfriend until I was 25, Five and being too scared to ask people out because of my rich and varied selection of self-esteem issues that I had at the time, because I couldn't ask people out. The teenage years where people were being more casual about their love life and dating people and living a bit of a more free and easy romantic existence, I didn't have any of that. Then went into my first girlfriend with my first kind of long-term relationship. I think also, if you've had those years of being completely ignored and not really feeling like you're in the romantic marketplace, and then through luck, really, you end up being a known person where you get a certain degree of confidence and you feel you suddenly do have a place in the world, part of you feels a bit as tragic as it might be. You're sort of owed a bit of that experience that you didn't have when you were 18. Yeah. If you have to go and do stuff, if you don't feel that you're ready for a committed monogamous relationship, just don't enter into one. Just be honest about it. It took me a long time to realize that because, you know, we are told that you should be searching for the one all the time. But you think sometimes if I don't work through the issues that I've got to work through, I'm just going to break the one's heart. And I don't want to risk that. I don't want to feel like that. I love that you recognize that progression, that you may have not had extreme heartbreak, but you've certainly gained lessons. Yeah. John, will you tell us about Moonfall? You play a conspiracy theorist. He is a conspiracy theorist. And, you know, 2021 wasn't really the perfect year to be making conspiracy theorists into the heroes of your movie. But I think if there's one thing that marks KC, my character in Moonfall, out from other conspiracy theorists, is that he is right. And that doesn't happen that often. I guess it's not exactly a conspiracy theory if you're actually right. Yeah, I mean, so many conspiracy theorists question things like medical science and question science. Casey isn't questioning science. He's fully on board with science. All of his findings and all of his discoveries are completely backed up by science. He's done his research. He doesn't have an agenda either. So much about conspiracy theories, I think, are about bending a certain set of circumstances to suit the agenda that they want to push. And he doesn't have any of that. He's just worried that the moon is going to smash into the earth. He's got research to back it up. And he wants to save the world before it's too late. I don't think that that's necessarily a conspiracy theory. Is that somebody who's done some independent research and just happens to have the tools at his disposal to save humanity? I like this. I think you're right. It is about a motivation, at least how the idea is seared into us now in 2022. Exactly. I think that if, for example, you don't want to wear a mask just because you don't want to, because you find them uncomfortable or because you think they don't do any good, that's one thing. But I think that if you start from that position, you then go searching for things to back that up. 
and that's where it all sort of spirals. It spirals with a sort of personal feeling towards something, but you feel that that's not enough. So you have to justify it by looking for this greater structure to your argument. And I think that's where a lot of conspiracy theories come from. People just trying to justify their own attitude towards something. I think that's a brilliant way to sort of describe that personality type. It is interesting that it's a desire in humanity. John, will you tell me about your parents? What personality traits do you think you inherited from both of them? The first thing about my parents with regards to myself and my career is that they were not theatrical people. They didn't have a sort of artistic side to them at all, really. We'd never even watched a lot of movies. We watched mainly like comedy shows, half hour comedies on television. And I think that that sort of set me up a lot for the way I think about acting, really. I was brought up with a wealth of entertainment because my parents were a little bit older, I think, than a lot of my peers' parents, pretty much 40 when I was born. That opened me up to a whole range of entertainment that my peers weren't necessarily exposed to. So, for example, they weren't just listening to the Billboard chart. They were listening to music from the 50s and the 60s. And they were watching Laurel and Hardy movies and Sergeant Bilko and old TV shows that my peers wouldn't have any kind of clue about. And because of that, I was able to cherry pick so much influence and so much cultural reference from this extraordinary large buffet of entertainment. And I always thank them for that, really, that they didn't just sit me down in front of Cartoon Network and just let me watch cartoons. They had me sort of watch television with them and I was able to watch quite mature programs and, you know, programs from 30 years before I was born when I was a little kid. And I think that gives me a great curiosity about entertainment and it's fed into my instincts as an entertainer entertainer and as an actor. And I just can't thank them enough for exposing me to all of that. Hey, Alison. Hi. Hey. How are you? I'm good. How are you both doing? Great. You're here with John Bradley, who is just awesome. Thank you so much for your letter. Will you tell us what's going on? Yeah. So I'm getting married in the fall. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Very excited. And over the past few months, I've started noticing some patterns of behavior from my maid of honor that have made me feel conflicted about having her in the wedding. A little context, we are also business partners. We run a company together. She bankrolls it, so she is my employer. And this past month, we took our work retreat. We do one every year. Usually, it's just the two of us on the trip. But this time, I ended up bringing my fiancé, and she brought a couple of her friends. So the dynamic was definitely different. Halfway through the trip, I ended up getting COVID and we were in a foreign country. I was waiting on a PCR result and we decided until we get the results, we would not make any plans on booking another Airbnb, canceling flights, do any of that. But I ended up isolating and realized after the fact that me leaving the group made the dynamic with my fiance and them very difficult. I found out that they kind of mean girled him a little bit that first night. My maid of honor made comments like, you're probably really tired. Don't you want to go to bed? Oh, no. And then eventually she was like, you know what? I'm going to go to bed. My fiance decided, "Okay, the night is over. I'll go to bed, too. And then found out soon after she popped her head out to her other friends and was like, hey, you still up? Let's go out. (laughs) Excluding him on purpose, obviously. And the next day, similar stuff. And the way my maid of honor talked to my fiance was very demeaning and condescending and rude. And hearing that that happened really upset me. So I ended up reaching out to one of my bridesmaids who has known my maid of honor for a long time, longer than I've known her, and found out that she has gone through this herself. My maid of honor used to date her now husband. We should call her something. Should we call her Sarah? Maid of honor Sarah, yes. So Sarah used to date Zach, and Zach is now married to Anne. 
when Anne and Zach started dating, Sarah would refer to Anne as the new girlfriend and she wouldn't call her by name and found out that she has a pattern of doing this with the partners of her friends. We'll just be rude to them for no reason and seemingly not respect the relationship. You also, Allison, have extraordinary circumstances. You met your fiancé right before COVID. So your fiancé didn't really get integrated into any of your friend groups for quite a while, right? Yes. So he and I met through a dating app one month before the lockdown. We ended up cramming a bunch of stuff in and we wanted to see each other constantly. So we had an amazing first month of dating. But yeah, once lockdown happened, I ended up needing to stay with him so my roommates could quarantine in my apartment. And he and I kind of just hunkered down, ended up thriving. But before the lockdown, I actually met almost all of his friends. He was really eager to introduce me to his circle. Awesome. I'm really happy for you. Thank you. But I didn't have those opportunities to introduce him to my people until things started opening up again. With regards to Sarah, your um, <clears throat> maid of honor, is she currently single? No. Oh, she's in a relationship. I was going to say, if you're single and your friends are single, and then suddenly they get a partner, you may feel that they're going to move away from you. But if she's got a partner as well, that makes it a little bit more delicate, I think. So is she always the same? Does she have the same attitude to her friends, partners, whether she's in a relationship or not? Well, she has been in a relationship the entire time I've known her with the same partner. She's also polyamorous and both of them will have their own other relationships. They do not live in the same country, so they spend half their time together, half their time apart. And I feel like she wants to get pregnant and she's having trouble. Oh my gosh. She also wants him to commit to her and propose and that's not happening yeah it sounds like she is sort of unfulfilled and maybe a bit unsatisfied in her relationship so she sees her friends entering into these very committed monogamous relationship and wants that for herself and some people if they feel that they don't have it, they don't want it for other people either. You know I mean? Do you think that's got something to do with it, maybe? I definitely do. And I definitely think it comes from a place of insecurity. Well, it's interesting to examine your relationship when you were single with her. I always talk about power balance in all of our relationships. Somebody has a little more power than the other for many different reasons. And sometimes it fluctuates. And I feel like she may have had that potentially before. And now she is feeling this shift. But I think there's also a bunch of other stuff at play here. When I read your letter, I was thinking, Allison doesn't have to have her as a maid of honor, but because you guys work together, I feel like this deal is done. Do you feel that way, Allison? I agree. Like our company, we are two peas in a pod. Everyone associates us together. If for some reason she was not standing up with me, someone would read into that completely. I feel like the course of action is not to remove her, but to navigate another way. Yeah. I think that's quite interesting to me to hear you say that you can't tell her that she's not going to be the maid of honor because people will read something into it or people will think something's happened. But I think if there's one day in your entire life where you should just want it to be exactly as you want it and you shouldn't even really be thinking about what other people are inferring or what other people think, then it's your wedding day. You know, fingers crossed for you is the only wedding day you're going to have. I just think like those wedding photographs are going to follow you around for the rest of your life. And you don't want to look at your wedding photograph and think, oh, that was the moment where I was photographed while I was thinking about what Sarah thought about or what other people thought about Sarah's presence or lack of presence there. Maybe I've got too much of a sort of romantic idea of what a wedding day should be, but it should just be about the two of you. I mean, do you realistically see Sarah being in your life for the rest of your life? Definitely for the foreseeable future. Okay. And you love your job. Is that right, Allison? I do. And we work really well together. We complement each other very well. And our company is experiencing some success, which is exciting. And we want to continue that trajectory. But I feel like if I took her out of the wedding, it might make the situation worse. 
I really feel for you because you're kind of stuck with your fiance having been insulted by her. I think you have to take a course of action that's going to require a shit ton of generosity if this is going to work. Mm -hmm. It sounds like she is a mean girl. And it feels arbitrary sometimes, like her loyalties. One thing that maybe it was said and maybe I missed it. When they all went to bed and then your fiancé went to bed and then they went out, does he know about that? And have you shared all of your concerns about this with him? Because, you know, it's your maid of honor, but it is his day as well. Yeah. So he definitely heard them in the hallway having conversation and leaving. This is like giving me high school nightmares. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I ended up waking up around 1 a.m., the sound of them coming home. And yeah, they were just hung over the next day. And it was very evident. He knows everything. And he's been sharing his experiences with me when I haven't been there. And he thinks that I was treated worse than he was treated because she never checked on me the entire time. And I had a really bad time of it. He would say, don't do anything on my behalf. Do what makes sense for you. And his perspective is like, I don't have to see her all the time. You do. And I can bite my tongue and be nice and polite when I have to. So he puts the decision in my hands. I think that's an amazingly kind and thoughtful thing for him to do. And I think that if you have shared your attitude towards it and you shared your concerns and you're united in that on the day, if he's going to be stood next to you that whole day, knowing that, you know, you have concerns about her and knowing that you're sort of stressed out about her input and her presence there, as long as you're together and as long as you're sharing that experience and sharing those emotions, then nobody else at the wedding really matters. It doesn't really matter if she's there or not, because the stress of that and him helping you to deal with that anxiety and those concerns, they're probably only going to make you stronger. So if you're going to have a wedding day when you're completely sharing absolutely everything, it doesn't really matter if she's there or not, I don't think it's your day and you're connecting on that level with him that's all that really matters right yeah i think this is like killer with kindness the good news is that it's not till the fall mm -hmm. you don't have to say i'm so glad you're my maid of honor but it's an experiment to your relationship if you are making a solid effort to make her feel loved and whatever she's needing right now, you know, because she's clearly needing a lot. This is what people bring to weddings. Mm -hmm. This is her contribution to your wedding. <laughs> Stressing you out. <laughs> <laughs> like more than the parents somehow. There's always somebody, just never know who it's going to be. Sometimes it's surprising. So I want you to enjoy this time, of course, of like being engaged, having fun planning your wedding. If this is not only your best friend, but your partner, your business partner, we want to protect those things. I think it would make you happier if she doesn't respond well. And in a month, she still does passive aggressive stuff or whatever. Then it's something to really reconsider. Does that sound awful, Allison? And do you think it would work? Do you think it would chill her out a little bit? I think it could go to her head. Uh huh. I also don't want her to think that she can still treat him as she has. Yeah. I don't want her to think that behavior is okay with me. Yeah. Just dive in for a second. I think that's an interesting thought, but I think that from everything that I've heard about your relationship and also the way that you talk about even your professional dynamic, you know, you say that she has the money for a start. She's the bubbly and the extroverted one and you're the one who does a lot of the work. It sounds like you've really bought into this dynamic of her holding more power in this relationship than you have. That's a fair point. And you see yourself as being in a sort of submissive position to her. So I just wonder if you were to make this effort Effort to reach out and show love and to be active in that. Do you think that's just reinforcing those positions and getting you into a deeper rut in that dynamic than you are already? You might be right, yeah. I think that's right. I guess this means the talk then. Yeah, and I don't know how to go about it because the feedback I've gotten from others that have gone through this with her, she's going to be very defensive. She's probably going to cry, that kind of thing. And she chipped in some money for flowers for the wedding. And I like want to give her that money back. And I feel like she'll be insulted. But also, I don't want her to have that monetary power over me. And also, one of my bridesmaids is pregnant and due three days before the wedding. So there's a chance she might not be able to attend. And for the tasting, we were able to invite a couple people. 
I invited the maid of honor, but now I'm wondering if I should relinquish that invite and give it to my bridesmaid who might not be able to be there. And I don't know how to address all those things. I'm worried that the emotions are so hot right now. Having been in several business partnerships that have ended, that were built on friendships, it's fragile. I'm worried that with this other stuff, the wedding and everything, that there's a chance it could sever your business relationship. Allison, is that a possibility at all? I feel like she knows how valuable I am to the company. And so the severance would not come from her. Oh, Oh, that's interesting then. Good. I like it. She's very afraid of someone else taking me away from her. Multiple (laughs) levels of that. (laughs) That idea of her being worried about somebody taking you away or being threatened, that sounds like it's a personal thing as well as a business thing. The idea that she knows your worth and you know your own worth to that company, it gives you a lot more power than you kind of think, really. In terms of the wedding day, if she is made of honour, Do you just not want her to be made of honor because of the way she's behaved in the past? Or are you concerned that something is going to happen on the day if she's made of honor that you want to avoid? I feel like the wedding is meant to be a celebration of our relationship. And if she doesn't respect that relationship, I feel conflicted having her right next to me. Also, I definitely see the scenarios of her getting upset. Oh, I'm never going to get married. This is never going to happen for me kind of trajectory. Well, then taking this idea to the extreme, would you see yourself in like the next two years moving on from this job? Two years, probably not. Five years, maybe. Yeah. She technically can't fire you, right? She could fire me. How would that feel? I would feel hurt because of our friendship. But I would know that I would end up on my feet and find another job without much trouble. I'm not sure how it works there. I know how it kind of works here. There are sort of rules in place where you can't just fire people because of personal... Doesn't there have to be some kind of justification for being fired that goes beyond, she told me I couldn't be the maid of honor at a wedding? That doesn't sound like a solid reason to fire somebody. Well, we don't have a contract. Oh, so there's no legal route you could go down if she did decide to fire you? No. The way I think of it is, if you can see her being out of your life in five years, then I think her being out of your life and not potentially ruining your wedding, you know what I mean? If you think a day will come where she's not in your life anyway, I think the wedding's too important. Well, at least not in my work life. Right. We have so many of the same friends. Right. Our circles are entangled. Right, I see, yeah. If you feel angry and aggrieved enough, which you have every right to, that you want to talk with her, then I think the approach is like, Sarah, we're kind of overdue for this talk. And I think both you and I have been feeling it. I'm sure you felt that we've kind of been growing apart a little bit. And I love you and I respect you. But your behavior lately has not felt very supportive And I really do want you to be happy for me. And maybe you don't realize it or whatever, but I am feeling kind of hurt. And I would really love it if we could just have some open dialogue here, because I know that there's things going on in your life and maybe I haven't been paying attention to them. Not saying that you are, Allison. I'm just good at throwing bones. (laughs) (laughs) You could do something like that, a gentle but firm John, what do you think of that idea? I don't think there's any way that she can have a problem with that. I mean, it's not even really a confrontation. It doesn't seem aggressive. It really is just a way of opening dialogue. She must have good points about her because you are close with her and you do have this close relationship. It's just occasionally when she is exposed to certain problems, she reacts in a certain way. But she must have a reasonable side to her. And I think it's about appealing to her reasonable side. And, you know, chances are you may come out of that conversation with her still being your maid of honor. But a dialogue has happened where, you know, you've been able to air your grievances. It doesn't even have to be a case of you've hurt me and therefore I'm not going to have you as my maid of honor. I'm going to replace you. It's just a case of saying before you do play this big part in the biggest day of my life, I'd just like you to know that just for my own sort of mental health and my own peace of mind, I'd just like you to know the way I've been feeling. I don't think that any reasonable person will have a problem with you 
voicing your concerns. It will probably not only make you look forward to your wedding more because you're on a much more firmer foundation, but also it might set a precedent for your relationship in the future as well, where she knows that she can't behave like that and you'll just accept it. I think a well-balanced, well-modulated conversation like that could be the start of a whole new phase in your relationship, maybe. And Alison, if and when you do talk with her, my advice would be to not mention your fiancé. Because if you say you were rude to him or whatever and lay that element out, she will just target him. Mm -hmm. Just one final thing. I think it's important to really make sure that all the way through this decision making process and leading up to this talk, if you are going to have this talk with her, be sure to keep communicating with those other people who have similar experiences with her because you don't feel quite so alone. And maybe you can speak to them and share experiences of her. And also, quite importantly, know that they're going to be there after the chat for you to share with them how it went and for them to give their insight into what happened. Then really use them as a comforting resource because it's so easy to feel kind of alone. But if people have had a similar, almost identical experience with that same person, it's just going to bolster to you to do the right thing and do what you need to do. Yeah. Thank you both for all of this advice. It has been so helpful and is giving me some tools. Good. Alison, thank you so very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's nice to talk to you. I really hope everything goes well. Thanks for sharing your story with us. It's really appreciated. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Thank you. Bye. Oh, man. I've never been sort of flip-flopping between two completely contradictory trains of thought in my life. Literally, one second, it felt like I knew the best thing to do. I think you'd find out a little bit more information. And that seems so wrong. I know. Like a second later. Because that's the thing, isn't it? Advice is the easiest thing to give and the hardest thing to receive. We can try and give advice, but it's so delicate and so nuanced. And every single argument is on such pillars of sand and can collapse at any moment. I feel so sorry for her. I know. John, I thought your advice was awesome. Let's think about this imbalance, how it has been there. Yeah, that was the thing, isn't it? If you can compartmentalize the short-term thing of the wedding is the only thing to care about and kind of offset that against concerns about your wider relationship and going into the future, then it's easy to paper over the cracks a bit for the sake of the wedding. And maybe that's a valid piece of advice, but it's just about long-term goals versus short-term goals and what precedents you want to set, really. Completely. And how you protect what you want. Absolutely. John, I heard you tell a story about being trapped, I think the first season, in an elevator. It sounded terrifying. Will you tell us that story? Yeah. It's a testament as well to, you know, my first ever job as an actor, you know, was on a show where we had the budget to erect a huge lift shaft (laughs) 40 feet above a stone quarry in Northern Ireland. Where are we in the show? It was in the far north. We shot it in Belfast in Northern Ireland in a huge stone quarry. So a lot of it was set, but a lot of it was real stone. And they built this lift shaft up the side of this stone face. And myself and Kit Harrington were in this lift. And all that had to happen was they were going to do a long shot of us descending in this lift. When it gets to the bottom, we'd walk out. And that was the shot. I love it that they are using you guys for the long shot. Yeah, I know, exactly. But we were so naive. We were so grateful to be part of the show we didn't even question it then so we got winched up slowly up this lift it was very very slow and I'm not great with heights anyway and we were lifted up to about 40 feet above the ground and bang suddenly got stuck like there was a shudder and you're going up we were still going up you haven't done the shot yet no 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 this is set in for the shot amazing the floor of this lift wasn't solid it was a grate oh god so we could see right through the floor onto the bare stone below and we were up in the lift shaft and we were laughing with each other going huh, isn't it funny the scrapes we get into <gasps> thinking that we'd look down and see the whole crew laughing along with us But the whole crew looked like they'd just seen a ghost. Oh, God. The faces that were looking up at us, it looked like they were looking at two men who were about to expire. That is when we started to get scared. If a crew with hundreds of years of experience between them are scared for you at any moment, you think, oh, this is something that's never happened before. So a guy, some hero guy, had to climb up the lift shaft by hand and manually let the brake off in tiny little increments. So we were juddering down like three foot at a time 
all the way down to the bottom. That's like when the flight attendant looks nervous. Exactly. That's exactly what it is. And funnily enough, a couple of years later, we were flying to Iceland on a tiny little internal flight from Reykjavik out to the location. And I've never had a flight like it. Game of Thrones nearly killed me many times. We were on this flight and trying to land in a snowstorm and the plane was juddering all around and we couldn't see out of the windows and I was so scared. And I said to myself, I'm going to look round now and see a lot of Icelandic people who aren't scared at all. They're not scared at all because this is just how you land a plane in Iceland. And I turned round and everybody on the plane was as terrified as me. <laughs> I was like, oh no, this is it, isn't it? I don't get scared very often, but it's amazing how fear is contagious. If the people around you aren't scared, you're not going to be scared. But if everybody in the plane is terrified, you're just going to be frightened for your life. Yeah, Game of Thrones gave me some amazing experiences, but scared the life out of me more than once. I was thinking it might be one of the few sets I would never want to visit <laughs> because it is its world, its precious world to the viewer, to the audience, you know. I wouldn't want that spell broken. I found that myself, you know, because we shot the show in these little increments and you were just with your group and then other scenes were being filmed with other characters. I didn't meet Amelia Clark in costume until season eight, until the very last season. And because you watch the show, but you don't feel like you've got anything to do with the rest of these characters, when I was suddenly standing in front of Amelia Clark as Daenerys, I was like, oh, I'm in Game of Thrones all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Really, it felt like I'd stepped into a show that I was a fan of rather than a show that I was in. You know, we were all such fans of that show. We were all so proud of it. Can I nerd out then for a minute? Your character, Sam, he's from the South, right? Yeah. Even though, maybe people do pick up on this in America, I was actually speaking in the wrong accent for the whole show <laughs> because I auditioned with what would later be a Southern accent in the show, which is a proper English received pronunciation accent. I auditioned in that. And then the guy they had doing the accents on season one got in touch with me and said, you're in the Northern storyline, so you'll have a Northern accent. And I was a bit like, are you sure? about this. And he was like, oh yeah, absolutely sure. Don't worry about it. I've seen the graph. So then because of that, I spoke in a Northern accent, even though my character was from the South for all eight seasons. But I don't think people care about that particularly. I think to us, it's its own thing, you know? Exactly. I mean, the fact that people don't really realize that I'm speaking in the wrong accent and I'm confessing it on this podcast three years after the last season was on, just goes to show that people don't really care about that type of thing, right? Well, when you have dragons, you can get away with a lot. Um, okay, so now we're going to talk with Ashley. Hey, Ashley. Hi, Anna. How are you? I'm great. You're here with John Bradley. Hey, Ashley. Nice to speak to you. Nice to meet you. Ashley, will you tell us what's going on? So I was born and raised in a small town. All of my family is close by. But of course, I meet a guy from out of state. We get married and we move to where he's from. We would go back to visit my parents and my sister about every month. Either we would go up there or they'd come back down here. My mom retired early because of her health. So it was more flexible. We have kids. We continue traveling. Nothing really slows us down. Then over the period of two years, my mom's health declines and she ends up passing. We would still make the trips, but it just wasn't the same. I guess you don't realize who the glue is in your family until things just don't stick anymore. Oh, Ashley. <laughs> so sorry. Thank you. My sister and my dad, they have more in common with each other. You know, they would go fishing or hunting or camping and Whenever we would go see my mom, she and I would hang out. She'd play with the kids, and that was her happy place. And when I would call her to see if we could come up, it was more like, hey, we're coming. And she'd be like, that's fine. Come on. Whereas now I kind of feel like I have to ask for permission. I uh, called my dad a few weeks ago to see if we could come see him over the next upcoming holiday. And uh, he kind of hesitated, and it made me feel like we weren't really welcome. Uh. When they think about home and what comes to mind, and one day I heard that and it kind of hit hard oh. because for me, going home now has this uncomfortable feeling, but I don't want to not go home. So I guess, how do I get past that? Oh, man, you must be homesick in general when you moved away, going back once a month, being close with everybody. You were very proactive in keeping really close to your family. And they haven't really reciprocated that sentiment to you, even though they love you and care about you. You're right. When I first read your letter, I thought, I wonder if Ashley's dad has seen somebody. 
I don't think so. Okay. He's pretty close to my sister now, even. My sister has got a boyfriend within the last year and they live about 45 minutes away or so. So he'll go down and spend time with her and they go on trips together. You know, we've asked them to come down and see us a couple times and they have a couple times, but why aren't they making the effort? <laughs> I don't know. Ashley, my brother is really sentimental and he is always the proactive person. And he is always the one who's like planning the family get togethers or whatever. And I'm just not of that mentality. I just want you to know, I'm sure that they love you. They just aren't in a pattern of any kind. It's almost like they need to be taught a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. John, what do you think? I think that you should really reach out to your sister, I think, first and foremost, and let her know just how important this is for you and just how much it would mean to you to reestablish that connection because you're all grieving and you're all grieving in different ways. And it's tough if those two seem close and it seems like you're on the outside of it. But what I'd do is I'd say to your sister, sadly, and my heartfelt sympathies go out to you guys, you know, we've lost a parent and I don't want to regret not spending enough time with my dad when he goes too, which, you know, is going to happen one day. The fact is I live in Manchester still. I live two miles away from my parents because the idea of them passing away one day and me not spending enough time with them while I was able to, I know for a fact that that's going to really haunt me. So I think that it's so important for you to talk to your sister and just bear your soul to her. Let her know how important it is that you establish a connection with her and with him. And then you can try and coalesce all together as a family unit, I think. Rather than having this schism, this chasm between you in one camp and them in another, you need to sort of coalesce. Right. Ashley, is your sister younger or older? She's younger. I'm the oldest. This totally fits in. My brother's older too. I think the older sibling does tend to be just more proactive. I mean, at least that's certainly my case. And me being the younger, we tend to be a little more self-absorbed. We're not always aware would you feel comfortable calling your sister and saying, I'm really sad over mom and I want to be closer to you. And I want to tell you that I need you because I haven't really told you this before, but I really do. Would something like that sound good? Could you say something like that to her? I could definitely try. She's kind of hard to talk to. Is your dad as well? He's hard to talk to, yes. Yeah, makes sense. This is setting up. Check, check, check. Mom probably wasn't. Exactly. I mean, you could even say, hey, I want to be closer to dad. I know you guys are really close. And maybe through that angle, too, you would get closer if you're actually talking about what you need and what you want in a more direct way. I got you. It's just kind of hard living a couple states away. Yeah. Whereas they live just a few miles away. Another thing that you need to sort of bear in mind is a certain degree of patience as well with your dad, because, you know, you are all grieving and he's lost his life partner. You've lost your mother. That grief is something that is not necessarily about creating a family unit for good times. You should want to be there for each other and you should want to be there for him. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a disturbing thing to happen to you. And maybe he's going through this grief in his own way and maybe he might turn a corner. I just think that a certain degree of patience Patience is required and just make yourself available to be a support and really sort of reestablish your credentials as a member of that family. You may be two states away, but it doesn't mean that you care less about him than she does and doesn't mean you care less about her than you ever did before. Reassert your position within that family and just try because you don't want to regret not making that effort. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I even think the attempt will resonate with her. Yeah. Even if she doesn't show it right away. I agree. It's still opening the door. Later in your letter, you mentioned planning an upcoming trip mm -hmm. and how they were, it's not that they wouldn't want to see you, but they weren't like, yay! <laughs> 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 this feels like these conversations need to be kind of had before you go exposing yourself to potential disappointment. Okay. Does that sound reasonable? It does. I think you're absolutely right. I think situations like this, managing expectations and expecting things to be a certain way, sometimes it can be the worst thing that you can do. It is about protecting yourself. As much as I've said, it is about, you know, living for your dad and making things as comfortable for him as possible and reaching out to your sister. You do have to look after yourself first and foremost. And as Anna was saying, if it's going to be something that actually causes you a certain degree of pain and confusion and disappointment, then yeah, maybe think about about a different approach to that. And I think that you, unfortunately, Ashley, will be the proactive member in these relationships forever. 
So I'm, kind of, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm kind of used to it. <laughs> well, yeah. And I know that you give them so much too. They take you for granted, I'm sure. You know, I would just start opening that door and see what happens. Okay. She can talk about her new boyfriend on and on and on or whatever. And you can just be like, oh my God, that's great. And I would start nurturing that relationship because I do think that phone conversations with your dad will be hard. He probably just doesn't have them. But I would have it over the phone though, Ashley, instead of texting, call her, see what happens. Okay, I can do that. Yeah? Yeah. (laughs) You can tell her what you need, you know? Yeah. Hopefully she'll know how to love you right back. I'm so sorry, though. You clearly were so much more close to your mom than to sort of feel this extra loneliness. But I don't think they mean to. I'm sure they love you. You're so lovable. I love you. (laughs) Well, I love you, too. Thank you. (laughs) But you mentioned that your mom was the glue, so they just don't have those skills yet. And they may never get them, but at least with that realization that you're not personally being rejected. Right. I don't think they do it on purpose. No. I'm sure that's not their intent at all. No. No. So I think it's just going to take patience and generosity. Yeah. Patience is so key to this because, you know, you're all going through so much pain and sometimes that makes people behave in slightly irrational ways. And, you know, it may be the case of they will turn a corner and they will want to reach out first and a time will come where you reach out and then they'll be responsive to it. And, you know, life is too short to not make the effort to express the love for the people that are closest to you. And I just think that now it's such a tumultuous time in all of your lives that a little bit of effort now, plant those seeds now, reach out, and then even if they don't respond to it immediately, a time will come where I think they'll be ready to. And Ashley, I also think you could plan a 4th of July thing. You know, does something like that sound good? Well, actually, my youngest daughter's birthday is in June, so I've invited them down to come see us, so hopefully that will work out. Are they going to? Do you know? They acted like they were. Oh, great. Okay, good. Then they can be on your turf. But before that happens, I think it'd be really good for you to get closer to your sister. Yeah. Reminder of the things that are the same about you and forget about the things that are different. You you say that they have different interests and you live two states away, but more makes you similar than makes you different. You know what I mean? You're the same DNA and you have the same parents and your responsibility to your dad is still the same. So just reestablish yourself as a family member and highlight the similarities and highlight all the things that you share and all the things that are different are only superficial and trifling, really. What unites you is much more powerful than what divides you, I think. And Ashley, they need you, at least then they're showing you because they are taking you for granted. So you need to tell them, this is what I need too. I need you guys. And just you keeping that in mind, you're going to have to be the bigger person for a minute. But I think it really will be rewarding. I hope so. And I'm so sorry. You're amazing. And I'm sure that you're someone that they can all count on. You know, if something were to happen, you would be there. Oh, absolutely. I know. I feel it in you. But Ashley, I'm feeling for you. I love you. Thank you. And thank you for taking time to talk with me. Thank you, Ashley. John, thank you so much. Oh, not at all. Sending lots of love to you. It was so nice to meet you. Oh, lovely to meet you. Thanks for sharing your story. Thank you. Bye, Ashley. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. John, you are so lovely. I mean, it's a real knot and, you know, families are very, very delicate and very complicated things. But I meant what I said, you know, I think when we have people like our family, we obsess with the thing that make us different and we sort of forget about all the multitude of things that make us exactly the same and unite us and bring us together. And the differences are nowhere near as important as the things that make us the same. I think that is a beautiful message. Okay, John, deal breakers. You're on a first date. Yeah. They believe they were abducted by aliens when they were younger. No, I want to hear more about that. Yeah, it's intriguing. It's intriguing, yeah. I may not believe it, but I'm open to hearing the experience of it. They'll make it to dessert with a good alien abduction story. Okay. But you know what? That's a trifling thing as well. I think if she wants to believe she was abducted by aliens and she's a sweet person, it seems petty of me to call it off because of that. Okay, they share custody of their cat with their ex. 
okay, that is a deal breaker, I'm afraid. Wow, right off the bat. Only because I'm powerfully allergic to cats. Oh, okay, all right. I can be with her while the cat is with her ex, but if basically I'll be a part-time boyfriend, I'll share her with the cat. <laughs> it's like me and the cat have like our own watch duty, and when the cat's there, I'm not, and when I'm there, the cat's not, so I don't think so. Unless she wants a sneezing boyfriend, potentially for the rest of her life. They have never seen Star Wars. Uh, it's not ideal, but it's not really a deal breaker because I get to show them Star Wars for the first time. What a great thing that would be to do to someone. I know. If they haven't seen Star Wars, I'll say, okay, next day I'm going to show you Star Wars. And not having never seen Star Wars is different to not liking Star Wars. So I think if she hasn't seen it, I'll show it to her and then I may change the rest of her life. We can bond over Star Wars. It can be our movie. Final deal breaker. They believe the Earth is flat. I mean, probably a deal breaker, but not in and of itself. I mean, if that belief was the end of it, then I could probably live with that. I could live with somebody who's wrong about something. But flat earthers tend to involve an awful lot of different other conspiracy theorists. And it's not just about believing the earth is flat. It's also about having a suspicious mindset and a kind of subversive mindset. And I don't want to be with somebody who's suspicious of absolutely everything in the world. I kind of like accepting people and that attitude of skepticism and disbelief, it doesn't finish at Flat Earth. It feeds into so many different parts of their lives. It's a huge part of their identity as a person. John, what a delight. I cannot wait to see Moonfall. And it's just been such a lovely pleasure to talk with you. Thank you so very much. Oh, the pleasure's all mine. Thank you so much for having me on. It's been lovely to meet you and talk to you and your lovely guests. And I hope we could have made a bit of a difference. Who knows? You were incredibly thoughtful and kind. And I so appreciate that. Oh, bless you. Well, you as well. This has been a joy. Thank you so much. <laughs> bye, John. Bye. Bye-bye. 